his neutral special, he wields a gun. Devil May Cry 2, considered to be one of the worst Devil May Cry games, and the other being DMC Devil May Cry. After playing both campaigns, I agree. Kind of. And I'll get to it. But yeah, Devil May Cry 2 is infamous with a lot of close friends wishing me good luck to play this game, so... Yeah. It also doesn't help that all of my friends want me to play 3, and because of this, my entire Discord has been full of Virgil posting. But I'll get to Devil May Cry 3 when I get to it. Released in 2003 for the PlayStation 2, it is a, and I'm using air quotes here, hack and slash. Like the game that came before it, except this time, the guns in this one are incredibly overpowered, and can be used to take down pretty much everything, especially in Devil Trigger mode. That pretty much just drains any enemy's life. The game is split into two discs, for some reason. Disc 1 is Dante's campaign, the longest one, while disc 2 is for the newcomer and only appearance in the series to my knowledge. Lucia. No, wait, apparently she appears in Devil May Cry 5, Before the Nightmare, which is a novel, so... It doesn't count. And in the HD collection, you just pick who you want to play in the main menu. Honestly, this game shouldn't have been two discs. But what do I know? I'm not a game developer. Anyway, the only history I have with Devil May Cry 2, if you can call it history, is the game Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. I say Devil May Cry 2 specifically because that's what it says in the back of the box. This is technically the game with a famous featuring Dante from the Devil May Cry series badge in front of the box, but that was only in the European version where it's known as Shin Megami Tensei's Lucifer's Call. In Nocturne, Dante is a boss. He's just kind of there. And he has a pretty cool battle theme. Thank you, Tracky, for the save file for I can record this small segment. Thank you. Anyway, let's begin with what little story there is. Well, since there are two campaigns, let's start with Dante. In a museum, there was a narration about how there was hope for the human world thanks to Sparta. In this museum, there's this lady, Lucia, breaking and taking a coin, it seems. Suddenly demons, and Dante falls from the roof and wipes them out. Apparently, Lucia called Dante here, and she throws a dagger at the map and leaves. So, we begin the island of... Vidimar Lee, also known as Dumari Island. Yeah, let's go with that. Where Dante sees a house and jumps down from a tower. So off to that house Dante goes. On the way there, demons appear. Arriving at the house, Lucia is there, and then the house explodes. And Lucia is looking for a matier. And this old lady walks out of the ground, and she knows Dante, and apparently fought along with Dante's dad, Sparta. And then she asks Dante to help out to take out this man named Arius. Dante is now two-faced from Batman and flips a coin. Dante goes through a catacomb and learns the power of flight in Devil Trigger. Leaving the catacombs, we end up in a town city thing where we have our first boss, the Orangera. He dies with the power of gun, and then Dante moves on. With a couple of minutes after, we have our second boss, the Jokaga. the Jokat Glum, who also dies by the power of gun.
a bike appears and Dante takes it and rides it off to a city where he fights infested tanks and an infested helicopter. Okay. Once the infected chapter gets taken down, Dante jumps from a building and now has to fight this thing. The Nephasterus. With the power of gun, Nephasterus becomes a floating head, and now with the power of sword and gun, he gets defeated. A helicopter with the words Ouroboros flies over and arrives at an oil ring or something. Now inside the facility, for some reason, going through it, Dante ends up in a helipad where Arius is there. He snaps in fingers and spots a Final Fantasy XIV boss. Guns and Sue and Ferritaris is taken down. Resident Evil escape sequence, and Dante escapes via the Dante cycle. Meanwhile, at some sort of ruin, he fights some moth monster thing named the Necto- named the Noctoparan. Jesus, these names- <sighs> Once gunned, Dante enters another catacomb. Inside, he fights the Volverk, an enemy with two wolves that attack you. Once defeated by the power of RPG, Dante moves on and gets the drop on Lucia. Lucia asks Dante to take the MacGuffins to Matia, then BDSM ball and chain guy appears, the Plutonian. And down he goes. Leaving the catacombs, Dante meets up with Matier and informs Dante that Lucia went to go fight Arius, and asks Dante to help her. He flips a coin and goes. Meanwhile, in this office building, Lucia is captured in a wall, and Dante appears and gives the relics to Arius, and Dante challenges him. What? Your swan song will. Gun. Arius tries to attack Lucia and Dante saves her. Well, Arius blows up his own building, and right after that, Lucia informs Dante that Arius created her. And Dante just goes after Arius. But before he can, he must open up this gate to the underworld, I think. And when it opens, the Phantom from Devil May Cry 1 appears and then get boomstick to death. An opening appears and Dante faces a horde of incoming demons and then makes it in. Inside is the office building, elevators and all. And all this is a mook rush with the only boss throughout there being Bulwark and after the final elevator section, Dante fights the logo from WWE Unforgiven 2001, the Trismagia. One firearm later, Dante meets up with Arius and turns out Dante switched an important medallion for his weird coin. Pseudo final boss go! And after a good devil trigger machine gun, Dante shoots him out of a building and meets up with Lucia. And then she wants Dante to kill her, because she feels bad because she was created by Arius, suddenly opening to the door of the demon world. Dante and Lucia has a conversation of who's going to go in, and she is concerned if he goes in he might never return and starts tearing up and Dante says the line, No. Devils never cry. And he flips a coin again, and then he goes to the demon world. But before he that, he gives the coin to Lucia. And with that, we have a mishmash of all the bosses throughout the game so far. Argosax, the Chaos. Once defeated, he turns to his second and final form, the Despair Embodied. Finally, Gun takes down the demon. Okay, yeah, that was a pretty cool scene. And with that, Dante drives off in the Dante cycle. And, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> no credits. <laughs> All right. 
Yeah, that was uh, that was the Dante disc, all right. Okay, moving on to the Lucia disc. Thankfully, Lucia's campaign is much shorter than Dante. Dante has 18 missions, while Lucia only has 13. And Lucia's story kind of goes through the same beats as the game, just in a slightly different order and in different areas. Lucia's disc begin the same way. Museum and everything. This time, she makes way to the tower instead. Inside the tower, she gains the power of flight in her own Devil Trigger boat. At the top of the tower, she fights the ball and chain guy, and then picks up a relic. Heading back to her home, we get the cutscene where the house explodes. Same cutscene where Dante flips a coin. Mattia asks if Lucia has found the other relics, and now there's only missing one. Lucia heads over the city, fights a tentacle monster, arrives at the city, and then fights an infested tank. She sees the Ouroboros helicopter fly away, and then she makes chase. She goes to the facility and meets Arius. And Arius informs that he created Lucia, and her real name is Kai. Ki, the most ancient bird. Some say Kai, but the meaning is the same. And orders her to give him the Arcana. And then makes her fight the moth demon thing. Then she appears in another catacomb and starts having an existential crisis. And here is where we have the dreaded water levels. I didn't really talk about this much in the first Devil May Cry game because it felt like rather of a footnote and it really didn't overstay its welcome. Yeah, the controls were a bit bad and it was only in first person mode, but it was doable and rather short. But this on the other hand, it's big, empty, linear underwater areas kind of just feel like padding for no reason. But again, it's nothing really too bad. Anyway, through this underwater section, Lucia has her own boss fights, the Toy Besu, and it's Alright, I guess. Unless your controller battery dies mid-fight, so, yeah. Escaping the water ruins, we end up in another fight with a ball and chain guy. After that, we get the cutscene where she gives the relic to Dante. Meanwhile, at the main office again, she confronts Arius and a fight ensues. And, like before, Lucia ends up captured. Dante arrives and the building explodes. Dante goes off and does his own thing. Mattia talks to Lucia and gives her a pet talk, which is rather nice to be honest. She goes off to open the door to the underworld or something, and before she can, the phantom appears. She hops in the portal and ends up in the demonic building. She fights the same Unforgiven logo, and then it shows that Arius is doing his ritual, and it skips to a post Arius defeat Dante. The portal opens, Dante flips a coin, and goes in and gives her the coin. Apparently Dante didn't kill Arius, and now he is possessed. And now Lucia has to do it. Once defeated, Arius goes full mental, and Lucia says the line, Devils, never cry. And Arius goes full Resident Evil now and has a final form, Arius Argosax. Defeated, he evaporates and Lucia is waiting for Dante. And Matia confirms him saying that Dante will be back, since everything was at it as it was with Sparta. Lucia notices that the coin is a double-headed coin. Roll credits, finally. In a post credit cutscene, she is what I assume to be Devils Never Cry from the first game, just with no Trish around, and you can hear Dante monologuing. Questioning if Dante will ever come back, she hears a motorcycle and runs out. And, uh, yeah, that is the story of it. So overall, the story is meh. And really, Dante went from a bit of a wisecracking edgelord to an angsty edgelord. And Lucy is fine for what she is and what they give her to work with. Arius is boring. I totally forgot about him throughout the story until you have to fight him. Dante honestly kind of just feels like he's there, not really doing much. Overall, a very mess story. Gameplay wise, I am mixed. With Dante, yeah, the joke of it you can just play is as a shooter. And yes, they are correct. You kind of can. It feels like using the sword feels like it has no impact and it's only there just to get devil trigger. That's it. Oh yeah, and the Devil Trigger, uh, like I said before, it just drains enemies like and bosses like crazy. Like, it's kind of just broken. Another quick note, one small upgrade, if you can call it that. You no longer have to go to the menu to switch firearms. Swords you still have to, but at least for guns, it's just a tap of a button. Lucia, on the other hand, you're better off using melee instead of her daggers and grenades. Well, sometimes. I do love her design, though. I just wish she played better. It reminds me a lot of Lucia from Street Fighter V. Same thing, love the design, i just not a fan of playing as her. Speaking of the design, once you beat the campaign with either Dante or Lucia, you get an alternate costume branded by Diesel. So yeah, that's neat. You also unlock Bloody Palace mode, and hard mode once you complete the game. 
And once you beat the game in hard mode, or use a code like I did, you can play as Trish. And she plays much closer to Dante from Devil May Cry 1. So that's pretty neat. And uh, yeah, that's Devil May Cry 2. Not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be much worse. But I still played it through completely. It feels like the whole game is a footnote. But it isn't bad. It's just meh. Anyway, with that finally out of the way, let's move on to the game that all my friends wanted me to play from the beginning. Devil May Cry 3's Dante's Awakening. I'll see you in the next video.